This episode and every episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Ironmonger Brewing. Visit Ironmonger at their tap room in Marietta, Georgia, or online at ironmongerbrewing.com. Open up a tab, grab a seat, and pour a pint. It's time for the Beer Guys Radio Show. You want free beer? Go to the brewery. Dedicated to the art, science, and enjoyment of craft beer. Yo, what's wrong with the beer we got? Now, here are your hosts, Tim Dennis and Brian Hewitt. And welcome to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We're broadcasting from the Beer Guys Radio Studios in Marietta, Georgia. And this week, we're talking with Logston Farmhouse Elves. I'm Tim Dennis, and with me as always is my good friend and co-host, Brian Hewitt. Hey, Tim. So joining us today, we have Shilpi Halamane and John Plutsack, owner of uh, the brewery and uh, the head brewer. I think I got that the names. That was all over the place. I was I was focused on getting yes. the last name said correctly, and I okay. forgot. So Shilpi is the head brewer, yes. and John is the owner. Absolutely. So we're going to talk about cool things like saisons, mixed culture fermentations, spontaneous fermentations, and Logston's uh, lager program. All good stuff. So, Shilpi and John, thanks for joining us. Hey, man. Thanks for having us. We uh, appreciate it. Absolutely. We just got into a bottle of your your Saison. I think you pronounce it differently, right? It's S-E-I-Z-O-E-N. So how is that pronounced? There's a little bit of a story to that. And, oh, man, real quick, I was really tempted to screw with you and tell you that you had the names backwards, but you got them right. You did well. See, we, yeah. that, we, didn't need, we don't need that in our lives, Shilpi. That's so. right. <laughs> Uh, so a little backstory there. Uh, the company was, and John, actually John will probably get into this more, but the Saison, we do just call it Saison, just like anyone would write normal Saison spelling. That beer and many of the beers from the company's origin were named by Dave Logston's wife, Judith, who is from Belgium and is a, a Flemish speaker. So she named a lot of the beers in Flemish, which is not a language many people are familiar with reading or writing or speaking so there's a you know she would have pronounced it saison and saison breda uh, okay. for our, the brett version of that but we always just refer to it as saison because you know we're not flemish because <laughs> that's it not flemish right because that's, people will I'm know not. what you're talking about yeah. if you say it that yeah, way it's important <laughs> yeah well that's we talk a lot about pronunciations on things we want to try and get them right but uh you know we were talking about like the kvike yeast of the pronunciation there and we did a lot of good research in the the end result that we found with that and words like rock or Rosh beer is, you know, there's dialects everywhere. So, you know, there, there could be a few pronunciations and, and saying it exactly this way or that way is not always correct. You know? So, yeah. I feel like as long as people know what you're talking about, right. you're doing fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure enough. Well, Brian, how's, uh, how's your week gone, Mr. Hewitt? Uh, it's been an eventful one. So uh, I'll just start off with, the, I like to get this out of the way, the Drink Your Cellar pick. I did, did one of those. Tell me. Thirsty Dogs. Wolver from 2015. Okay. That is a delightful beer. It's a wee heavy, a bourbon barrel aged wee heavy, as I recall. Held up really well. It's like, well, it's perfect. I mean, it's it's in the double digits percent wise. Just a wonderful beer. And it's got a nice little barrel funk to it. It's got all the, the nice richness, all the sweet notes. Fantastic. Loved it. See, those are the kind of beers that you want it to be 40 degrees out, 30 degrees out in a fireplace going. Set in your leather chair, get you a pipe. Whether or not you smoke a pipe, get one because it's exactly. going to pair well with that beer. I think the AC was back. turned down to 68 or something at that there time. You go. So it was See, it counts. was comfortable. It was nice. Yes. Yeah. That's as close as you can get. And it went well with a cigar. Good so, stuff, yeah, man. It was good. good it's good. Absolutely. What did you get into, Tim? You know, Brian, I had an active weekend, but then I didn't do squat the rest of the week. I took it easy, took it lazy, but went out, uh, picked up some beers. One of our local favorites, Halfway Crooks, they released a few beers. So we went out and got into them. They've got a pale ale called Mesh. That is just phenomenal. Big citrus. Yes. I got like a. That's actually an a, IPA, I believe. An IPA? I believe okay. that is an IPA. I got IPA, like yeah. a peach or nectarine in it, Brian, and a, kind of a green grassy and all that. So, yes, an American IPA. My mistake, but uh, delicious stuff. Went over there. So, for those not in Atlanta, we have an area called the West End, Lee and White area, and it's kind of our beer district. We've got, uh, what well, we've got three breweries there now. A, Four, I think. Three oh. breweries, a distillery, and yeah. a kombucha place so we went down there and made the rounds and then a beer bar and all that so we went down there and made the rounds to uh, monday night brewing they've been releasing these big double and triple ipas from their hop hut series uh, we went to wild heaven and checked them out and uh, 
we just made the rounds, Brian. That head full of doubt, finding that again was really nice. I almost forgot. I had to say this. I was out getting barbecue, and there was a story recently. I don't know if we got into it that uh, Coors is axing St. Archer Gold. I saw one there, so I drank a St. Archer Gold, okay. Tim, just to find While out what it was like. you can, right? Yes, and better than Mick Ultra. Okay. Not bad for a low-calorie beer. It's right. not something I'm going to reach for, yeah. but beats the heck out of that. So yeah. I don't know what people are thinking drinking Mick Ultra do what you can yeah. right shelby john anything exciting for you guys this week oh uh, yeah i just finished brewing a batch of uh urban encore one of our farmhouse sales today so i'm covered in sweat and grime um sure but yep. feeling good i've got a glass of our smoked hellas hellas for sinners in front of me here which is <laughs> okay nice. all right yeah <laughs> hitting the spot pretty nicely i don't know what john's sipping on yeah uh, i'm sipping uh, our Czech style Pilsner that we just packaged last week. It was our first time brewing and packaging it. Little four and a half percent Pilsner with all Bohemian Pilsner malt and uh, Saz hops and uh, just really good for this summer weather. Yes. Yeah, we're all about those. Oh, we, yeah. We were drinking those. The brewery we mentioned earlier, Halfway Crooks, that we went by, they're known for their their lagers, really. They do a ton Crispies. of really, really nice lagers. So. We've been having a bit of a heat wave yeah. here, so it's sure. lager time for us. Now, what's a heat wave for you? It gets above 62 in Portland. <laughs> yeah. yeah, in Portland. <laughs> right. uh, we've been in the 80s. Uh, we're going to have a weekend in the 90s, high 90s. Okay. Yeah, that's it's not hot. so humid though. So like you guys would love it compared to Atlanta. Man. Oh, I know. And I, I did love yeah. it when I was there. Yeah. That's we've been this week we've been we've cracked ninety every day and got up into the mid nineties a couple. It's just oppressive heat. Hot and yeah. sticky stuff. Man. I get my humidity on the brew deck though. So that's right. Get it where you yeah. <laughs> well, I think we need to get into the beers of the week, Tim. Crack open a cold one. It's the truck and tap beer of the week. <laughs> Craft beer and food trucks in downtown Woodstock. Truckandtap.com. Well, Brian, as always, we've got a great list of beers to get into, man. Fantastic stuff. As we mentioned, Locks and Saison that we're enjoying there. Very good stuff. We pre-gamed with one from Tucker Brewing here, TKR Pilsner. Speaking of the Crispy Boys, Brian. Oh, yeah. We've got that Pilsner. Uh, we've got one from Second Self Brewing. You went out recently, Brian, and did a, a preview of some beers there. And we've got their Black is Beautiful, the collaboration yeah. beer there that they've did we've also got one from almanac passion project which is a sour farmhouse aged in i think oak barrels with cedar cedar spirals cedar yes. spirals uh passion fruit and spices yeah brian so we got it all those good beers to drink so exciting brian what's happening this week in the news what's in the news the beer guys have the scoop extra, extra, read all about it. time for headlines okay according to forbes there's big news in massachusetts massachusetts brewers and distributors have come to a compromise on franchise laws if the bill that's working its way through the senate passes nearly every craft brewery in the u.s will be able to terminate their contracts with massachusetts-based wholesalers for no cause whatsoever of course there's going to be a catch Breweries will have to provide 30 days notice, not a big deal, and they will have to, quote, pay fair market value for the brands being terminated. This only applies to breweries producing fewer than 250,000 barrels in the previous 12 months. So, of course, that means breweries like Sam Adams are exempt from this reform. So I think it's weird that uh, breweries can create these beers, but somehow they don't really have to own their brands. They have to buy them back from the distributor to change distributors. Beer Twitter was conversing about this this week and and just saying, you know, how ridiculous it is, the relationship there with distributors. And, you know, I threw a comment out there, Brian, that it's such an uneven balance there. And in the states where you can't leave for any reason, some of the brewers deal with issues silently just because for fear of repercussions. Oh, sure, sure. They can devastate you. So we've heard a lot about Stone's legal battles with Coors over the years, but we haven't heard much about their other legal activity. Specifically, Stone is disputing the trademarks of nearly 100 breweries around the country, most of them small craft breweries. The one getting the most attention is Saw Stone Brewing in Kentucky. The name of Saw Stone is all one word, which is you'd think they'd like that, refers to the sod or cut limestone that was used to create the historic building. While there are technically these are technically trademark disputes and not cease and desists, if Stone wins the uh, dispute, the results will be devastating legal fees, merchandising and glassware costs, branding costs, loss of recognition, all of that stuff. As it stands now, it's a big deal. Saw Stone has started up a GoFundMe to help with dealing with the legal costs. That so. Stone Brewery or Bells? Who was that you're talking about? Stone Brewing. They're disputing the trademark. Yes. Crazy stuff. Yeah. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take a break. 
but we'll be back right after these messages. Are you really doing Facebook right? I'm Aaron Williams, and here's your Marketing Minute. Facebook is a fantastic place to communicate with your fans. I'm sure you're using it to let people know about your specials, new beers, events. In other words, you're talking at your audience. Instead, try talking with your audience. Start conversations, ask questions, and show your fans what's going on behind the scenes. You'll make more of them, I promise. For more marketing tips and tricks, head to crafted-consulting.com slash radio. Have you ever thought about owning your own brewery but don't know what it takes to get one built? We're Storytime Construction, and we build breweries. We're Georgia's most experienced and hands-on contractors when it comes to building new breweries and tap rooms or expanding existing breweries. We offer full build-outs, remodeling, and additions, as well as consulting and construction management. Give us a call at 770-733-4343. Storytime Construction. We build breweries. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. To be the man! You gotta beat the man! Woo! Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Remember, all episodes are available on demand. So if you missed the broadcast, get the podcast. Beer Guys Radio is available on all popular podcasting apps. Now let's get back to our talk with Logs and Farmhouse Ales. Gentlemen, once again, thank you for joining us. We do appreciate it. Uh... We're looking forward to chatting with you here, and we're going to start with something kind of interesting because I looked on your website and kind of read the timeline of Logston Farmhouse Elves, and uh, pretty interesting history there. And the, do, Are you familiar with the story of, uh, I think they call it the story of Lincoln's Axe? No. So the story there is that I think it was an axe that belonged to Lincoln that's in the, I think it's in the Smithsonian, but they replaced the, like they replaced the hilt, and then another year they replaced the head, and another year they replaced this piece. And at the end, they're saying, well, they're like, is this still Lincoln's axe? So that's that's kind of I was looking at Logston. And I saw the changes there. Is is any of the original team still part of Logston at this point? It is a kind of a convoluted story that not a lot of people have asked about. And uh, a lot of times people will ask for, you know, you'll do an interview with a reporter and what came out of your mouth and what goes to print are two very different stories. But, sure. Uh, so it was found, uh, Logston was founded by Charles Porter and Dave Logston, who were good drinking buddies. And I believe Charles worked at Full Sail, which Dave was part owner of back in the day. And that's how they met each other. And before any of the first batches were brewed, Dave asked me to start a distributing company so I could distribute his beer. And a couple of weeks went by and he asked my wife and I if we'd like to buy into the company. And, you know, we seen his track record with Full Sail and with Y East Laboratories. And I myself have always been into good food, good beverages and stuff like that. And I thought it was a great opportunity. So uh, I was there for the day that the first beers were brewed. And I've, uh, besides taking about one year off, I've been here ever since. Okay, interesting. So you were there from the beginning. John's always hesitant to mention, but uh, he and Dave are family, and so technically the the company is still in the family. Still in the family, the original there. owner. Yeah. So it's still Lincoln's axe, is what it, it is. is. So. Yeah, okay. Okay. It's locks in his axe. Yes, right. yeah, it still is. I made a little note on my notepad here to to look up that Lincoln's axe story. I think you just named a beer for us. There you go. Yes. Good stuff. We'll keep an eye out for that. I'll yeah. be honest with you. When Tim said that, I mentally put together what it must be, but I had no idea about the story yeah. either. So, yeah, yeah I yeah. did. It's I was in the same boat. I think it gets the adage is, is told for various things. Viking ships and Lincoln's axe sure. and all of that. So. You replace enough parts. What do you have That's at the right. end of it? What do you Who got knows? there? Absolutely. You have the original location, a farmhouse brewery. What was the uh, the motivation behind opening up uh, the new facility in Washougal? When Dave retired a few years ago, one of the stipulations was he wanted most of production moved off of the original farm location since it is where he lives as well. He wanted to kind of have more of his life back and not as many people coming and going. So we looked for quite a long time. We had originally planned to move to Portland. 
But the opportunity here in Washougal, there was an existing brewery. They uh, were looking for someone to fill in because the last tenants were leaving. And so it was a lot better, uh, a lot less financial output from us to get in here and use the existing system and equipment. And still not too far from Portland. That's kind of how we ended up here. I have something to add to that, like from a production, from a brewery standpoint, uh, or rather from a brewer standpoint, the uh, the equipment at the farm was super rustic. It was pretty old school. We had a steam boiler that was an electric element boiler from the 70s that we'd had to replace the elements on numerous times. The brew house itself was, yeah, well, it was like 30 years old or so. It was uh, it was the, the pub system, which is a company that doesn't exist anymore. And something Harvard's Har- something Harvard's brew John Harvard's brew house or something from Boston. It was pretty old and it served us really well and it's still over there. Uh, we didn't have temp control. We had a water circulation system that would break periodically. The barn that we were brewing in is over a hundred years old. It's where Dave started Y East Laboratories back in the day in the, in the eighties before moving it to a, a proper facility. And uh, it was kind of, you know, MacGyvered together and MacGyver fixed numerous times. So we were losing a few months out of the year in the wintertime to cold weather, frozen water pipes, etc. And then the summer we would, you know, free rise fermentations were like in danger of getting into the 90s all the time. So basically we were like, okay, there's only so many band-aids you can put on equipment before you got to replace it. And if you're going to replace it, you got to spend a certain amount of money and a certain amount of time uh, losing production. And that coupled with Dave's retirement and the uh, request to move production off site made it a no brainer that we were going to look for something that had more usable equipment. And here in Washougal, it's not the most amazing equipment, but it certainly is functional. And we have temp control and it's allowed us to produce all the beer we want. Like definitely as much beer as we were producing before we can produce here. And in addition, we have extra tanks so that we can maintain a separate, we maintain a separate set of pumps and hoses and gaskets that we can brew non-mixed culture, non-Bertanomyces beers as well. So that's why we've, started brewing lagers and IPAs and everything that you would need to have for a small town tap room, which we have here. So Shelby there with the, with the brewery and the farmhouse brewery, do you still do any brewery there, any brewing there at all? Or is, is that retired? So it's officially retired. Now, when we first moved to Washougal, we were operating both brew houses. So the first summer We kept brewing at the farm, and we weren't brewing in Washougal because we weren't licensed to do so yet. And uh, so that was a full a full summer of fruit processing and brewing at the farmhouse. And then, as we moved into that first transitional year, we brewed a few batches, and we did a little bit of cool ship brewing because we had a cool ship there. And for for context, the farmhouse brewery is it's three floors. And the ground floor has the brew house, a room for fermentation, a room for like chemicals and a little bit of uh, like our hydrometers and a sink station and stuff. And then a room with the milling station and uh, like grain mill and then a room with the fermenters and a bottling line. And then we had a, a cave for barrels that was kind of dug into the hillside. And so we operated there. And we left all of our barrels there and we're continuing to operate that stuff. And we started kind of test brewing in Washougal. And then in the summertime, we it's too hot to brew cool ship beers. So we kind of transitioned that summer, the second summer, into more operations in Washougal. And in that downtime, there were several pieces of equipment at the farm that fell into disrepair, unfortunately, and were not usable. So it was kind of time to make a decision on sink some money into fixing these things or just transition fully. And just do something. the Washougal sure. Brew House yeah. is capable of doing everything we needed to do except for having a cool ship at the base of a mountain. So like that's the only thing that we haven't done in Washougal is do any uh, cool ship beers. Well, that yet. is a we'll bummer, transition to everything I else. i got to say that. So Yeah, seriously. I was wondering yeah. what you might do for that the cool ship that the Tawar, you know, how, how are yeah. you going to maintain that at the new location? Uh, so we still have some barrels that are 
from the old program. And there are some ways to keep that culture alive by feeding it wort and keeping those barrels alive. But we're going to have to start over, essentially. Bring the rafters over, right? Yeah, take that wood down. <laughs> bring the rafters over to the new brewery and let it bring the culture with you. It's it's hard to think about it. The more you work in the farmhouse, everyone always is like they lament the loss of the farmhouse as a brewing location, mostly due to its aesthetics. It is beautiful. Sure. There's no denying yeah. it. We love the cows and feeding them the grain right out of the mash tun. Love the mountain views. Loved everything about that aspect, but. From a brewer's point of view, it's kind of a nightmare to work with constantly failing equipment. And like, I got electrocuted a bunch of times. And <laughs> That's oh, geez. Like, fun, fun. There's all kinds of issues with the place from a brewing yeah. standpoint. So gotcha. I'm actually thrilled to use predictable equipment. And uh, yeah, so that part, I'm okay with it. The aura of a farmhouse brewery sounds really cool, though. It, so that's it does nice. seem really yeah. cool, yeah. You're listening to the Beer Guys Radio Show. We do need to take another break, but we'll be back very soon with more from Logston Farmhouse Sales. You know we love good beer, and Athletic Brewing makes non-alcoholic beer that stands shoulder to shoulder with their boozy brethren. With a fraction of the calories and certified organic, it's a great beer to enjoy anytime. Athletics got new brews like Cerveza Atletica just in time for summer. Check out the full selection at athleticbrewing.com. Use code BG25 for 25% off your first order and U.S. customers get free nationwide shipping. Athletic Brewing, brew without compromise. It's Brian and Tim, the beer guys. If you're like us, no lunch or dinner is complete without a pint or two of craft beer. Which is why Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth are always on our list. Tim, why do they call it Truck and Tap? Well, the tap part is easy, Brian. They've got 18 of them. As for the truck part, that's where it gets interesting. Truck and Tap features your favorite Atlanta area food trucks, so you're getting a different menu every day. Truck and Tap in downtown Woodstock, Alpharetta, and Duluth. Truckandtap.com. Let them know that the beer guys sent you. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. I want to give a quick shout out to one of our great radio affiliates, KFIR 720 AM in Albany and Salem, Oregon. Catch Beer Guys Radio on KFIR every Sunday at 5 AM local time. Let's get back to our conversation with Logston Farmhouse Ales. 5 AM, Brian. 5 a.m. Get up early, have your Sunday morning coffee. Get ready with some beer, guys. And listen to some beer, guys. It's the way to do it. Pour yourself a big, big... uh, Coffee stout. Coffee stout, yes. Yes, Absolutely. Beer Guys Radio. Yeah. Shilpi, we want to talk to you about Saison, since I I know you know a thing or two about Saison. We're fans of Saison. We've mentioned this before, Brian and I. I'm fans of you being fans. Good, man. Yes, we in our (laughs) homebrewing days, we haven't done it in a while, but our quote unquote flagship was a saison so we've we've brewed uh quite a bit of saison a lot of saisons we yeah. drank a lot of saisons so a lot of variation can be done with saisons they can. dark saisons yes. tomato basil saisons uh, a lot of things can I'm, be done we're with not that. going there <laughs> terrible terrible, <laughs> terrible. Good God. so yes right yeah so uh, shelby in your opinion what makes a great saison well so that there's a loaded question uh, right recently someone asked me how to define a saison and after going through the whole you know historical to our best knowledge historical origin of saison as a field beer of low alcohol for quenching the thirst and providing some calories for workers to its current day stronger alcohol, pure pitched strains, or the rustic versions that are mixed culture. I came up with an analogy that was like Saison is is sort of a, a useful and useless term. It's like saying you had a salad for dinner. It doesn't really tell you what it is. It okay. just kind of tells yeah. you sort of what it is. And uh, so to me, a good Saison is something that is yeast driven. The predominant character of the beer will be an expression of the yeast you used. So it could be that you did a high temperature fermentation and it's really estery. It could be that you didn't and it's not. But to me, the the yeast is the most important thing. The malt selection is important, but less so. 
hops also important, but less so. Uh, water can be very important uh, in all beers, so I'm not going to discount that. But to me, a, a good saison, the way we brew it, is moderate alcohol strength to strong alcohol strength and very dry, focused on yeast, and it should be easy to drink, but it should have enough character where if you want to take your time and let it warm up and try and taste the nuance in it, there's plenty there for you to taste. Like I said, you know, I mentioned I love Saison's, uh, Saison's, Grisettes, table beers, everything yes. in that family of beers. And that's one thing I've noticed. A lot of times people try to make a table beer. You get too low and it just loses its life. It loses its character, you know. But yeah. uh, when you find one that's good. But then I, I think if I'm going to drink a 3% beer, I want it to have something to taste like. And Absolutely. I sure. don't think there's another way to do a 3% beer other than with a farmhouse yeast strain. Right. Uh, and have it have anything interesting going on. That's true. Just hop water otherwise, right? Yeah. Seriously. Or just water. <laughs> or just water. Exactly. And you know what I took away from that, Tim, is saisons are technically salads. So this is a salad. That's <laughs> yeah. right. That's, 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 that's what I took away. Part. That's all I hey. heard. Whatever gets you through the night, man. <laughs> that's, that's right. right. Or the day or the, the morning. You know, either Go way. veg, Brian. That's right. Go veg. I'm going veg. Yeah. So, <laughs> Shilpi, I mentioned grisette there. What is the main difference in a saison and a grisette? Okay, so Grisette has its own weird origin stories that you can believe or not believe as being kind of like in similar to Saison being a beer for the working class and uh, low alcohol as well. I think Grisette translates to something like gray. And uh, the story for that is that it was a coal miner beer and they were covered in soot, so they were gray. Okay. Um, right. To me, a Grisette is sort of interchangeable with low ABV Saison in the modern day. When I brew a grisette, I use some quantity of wheat, I use Pilsner malt, and I may or may not use some oats or some other grain. It's pretty stripped down. I'll use less of a yeast blend. So you guys have our, our flagship Saison in front of you. I'll give you a, for instance, the, of uh, Dave Logston's intent and way of writing recipes from the old school beers. So when uh, when Logston was started, there was just the one beer, Saison, that you have there. And then there was another beer that came after that called Saison Breda. And Saison Breda is not quite the same beer. It's a little bit stronger and it has one different malt choice. But it's very similar in its brewing practice. And then it's finished in the in bottle conditioned with our house strain of Britannomyces, which is something that Dave found in a bottle of beer that wasn't supposed to have Brett. And he liked the okay. way it tasted. Right. So he banked it himself as he ran a yeast company. And now uh, we've just been rolling with it, you know, for years and years. And it uh, occasionally it would mutate in flavor a little bit, not much, but just just a tiny little bit. So we would re we would rebank it at that point, so okay, that we had sure. different touchstone versions of our house Brett strain that we could pull from. We've talked the last couple of weeks about our love for Brett beers, and you, oh, you yeah. don't see enough of them anymore. Fading, yeah. Three four years ago, it was the hot buzzword. So yeah, I mean we we still love it, and we still use yeah, it all the time. Sure. We still keep a tank with a Brett prop all the time. Uh, with our house strain and we use it to finish a lot of beers. Um, so like right up until the blending stage, a lot of our base recipes may not have anything wild going on. And then Brett and bottle conditioning is like a strong part of what makes Logston beers taste the way they do. So for instance, that Saison that you have in front of you has four yeast strains in it and Saison Bretta has five yeast strains in it. And so we're talking about a beer that's really simple in terms of malt bill. It's Pilsner wheat and oats and then, or Pilsner wheat, Munich and oats. And then yeast wise is where it gets all of its character. And the hops were really simple too. And we were using a whole leaf hops, just uh, Fuggles and Goldings pretty much. And, you know, it doesn't get any simpler than that, but the nuance comes in the fermentation and the downstream handling and the bottle conditioning and all that. So out of curiosity between the two, the Saison, the Saison Breda, is one of those still one of your best sellers or your most popular beers, or are people kind of latching on to some of your newer creations? John could elaborate, but for me, I think we still think of Saison Breda as our flagship, but you know, the market has definitely changed. And Saison Breda is not a beer that we're prepared to change formats in exactly or process. So that's always going to be a bottle conditioned beer. As it if should we be. Were, 
Yeah. Yeah. And if I think the only way that we would ever feel comfortable doing Cezanne Bretta in like a can, for example, would be if we allocated a tank to do the Brett fermentation in so that it was a fully fermented out finished product and then we could package it. But I don't trust necessarily can conditioning quite yet without a bunch of testing. So not going to get into that. Uh, Have you thought about adding some fruit and lactose to it? Yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> about 25 pounds per barrel. How do you say uh, milkshake uh, in, well played. <laughs> in <laughs> Flemish? Right. Yeah. 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 Say pass. We'll, we'll get right on that. <laughs> right. Yeah. See all these great ideas we're coming up with today? Usually I have the terrible ideas. Yeah. Tim, this time, is bringing them to you. Yeah. If you stopped after fruit and didn't say lactose, I was about to say like, yeah, we do that all the time. We do it every year. <laughs> no, no. Got a milkshake, a little bit of glitter, maybe. So. Maple syrup. You forgot an obvious one, Tim. Yeah. It's got to have you maple should, uh, syrup in it. You should check out our, our beer, Passion Brit, which is, see, you know, at its core, brewed just like Saison Breda, uh, maybe a little stronger. And then we take the, the Breda that's in tank and we add a lot of peaches and we have a bunch of in hood river there and Mosier, which is the a next town next door. There's a lot of different orchards, both for peaches and cherries and plums and whatnot. And we have established pretty good relationships with a lot of the farmers and uh, orchard owners. And so it's been nice using the same fruit from the same farms year after year. And then sometimes, you know, foraying a little bit into using fruit from other farms but always keeping it local and getting like really different results every year and letting the blending day be a unique thing so that every year's release is a little bit different. And hopefully a consumer understands that and they can, you know, find what there is to enjoy about each year's release. And I think that we've, we've had a really strong release of Passion Brett the last few years and I've enjoyed how it's come out. Yeah. Like other than the lactose, like, yeah, we do that. <laughs> we are out of time for this segment. We'll be back very soon. You're listening to the beer guys radio show. We're going to talk more with Logston farmhouse sales. It's time to take your snack back with bold flavors that complement your latest brew. Southern Recipe Small Batch Pork Rinds will do just that with flavors like Korean Kimchi Barbecue, Honey Chipotle, Cilantro Lime, and more. Munch on these beer-friendly bacon bites right out of the bag or crush them in your favorite recipes as a substitute for breading. Find your next bag at Kroger or go to southernrecipesmallbatch.com for recipes and a buy two, get one coupon. That's southernrecipesmallbatch.com. Craft beer forged with a reverence for tradition and new styles that start a revolution. Ironmonger Brewing. The brewers at Ironmonger Brewing pride themselves at being masters of barrel-aged, hoppy, and sour beers. They invite you to their tap room in Marietta, Georgia to taste and see. Also visit their barrel room for an intimate drinking experience with great live entertainment. Keep up to date on all things Ironmonger by liking them on Facebook. Ironmonger Brewing. Establishing a new standard in craft beer. Follow the Beer Guys on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Oh, God, here we go again. Dork alert. Now, back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. Welcome back to the Beer Guys Radio Show. If you enjoy the show, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash beerguys. Patrons get cool perks like Beer Guys swag and commercial-free episodes. Now let's get back to Logston Farmhouse Ales. Shilpi, we want to talk to you some about kind of some science, science. here, some sciencey stuff. Brian, I think you had a question. You found some information where he had done a homebrew con seminar, right? Yes. It's a guy who formerly brewed beer himself and now just ferments vegetables. I saw that yeah. you did in 2018 a course. Stay in your lane. A thing on, <laughs> yes, exactly. Stay in my lane. On course correcting and guiding your beer to success. And my question was seeing that, how on earth do you course correct a beer? And this this has got to be good. I'm like, I have to know. That was a tricky seminar to put together, not least of which because I was quite hungover. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the tough part. That, that oh, is a no, challenge, right. yes. Yeah. This, on that topic, I'm going to go ahead and give you a sound effect here. All right. There we go. Yeah. All right. See? <laughs> so uh, just for a side note, I'm, I just opened a Passion Brett 2020, which Ooh, sounds good. is our, our peach saison with Brett, which 
Oh yeah, more sound effects. All right. So all right, that was a tricky. I hear the pour there. So basically, I was uh, the the Olympics were on uh, when I came up with the topic, and I was in a bar and I saw a curling. And curling's not very exciting, but the the goal in curling is slide the stone. Oh, very nice. And yeah, there we go. Yeah. And then your teammates, or you know, forget about the teammates and the actual rules of the game. You basically you can course correct it on its way, right, by taking certain actions, and their actions use brooms. And then for some reason, I was like, oh, that's kind of a good analogy for wild beer brewing because a lot of the times when you brew a wild beer, you take certain actions, and you can be really, you can have strong convictions about the actions you take on the brew day, but then you know, several weeks later, it's time to do something else, maybe a cone dump, maybe a dry hop, maybe a, a co-ferment with some fruit, maybe something else is going on. Maybe it's a barrel action that's going on. And then several months down the road from that, you might take another action and then it just keeps going. And th- these are all opportunities to make the beer better or worse. And so I wanted to let homebrewers know that if they were brewing wild beer at home, and they don't have the benefit of a pro brewer, which is that we have multiple barrels. And if a barrel goes south, you don't have to include it in the blend. And that's how you can, you know, control the quality of the final product. If you didn't have the, uh, you know, the foresight to put down a lot of beer, you may not have the end product that you wanted. So I wanted to try and give some tips on things you can do to preemptively mitigate some places for failure. So I talked a little bit about how like let's say you have to move like a lot of people move i've moved constantly in my life and every time i moved i probably had some fermentation projects going that i was like a little bit scared about they're not going to survive so i talked about some tips to move and have your stuff survive i talked about some tips for blending i talked about some tips for brewing wild beer on a quicker time scale and then i mostly i took questions that was the idea the goal was to take as many questions as possible and Try and put things in more of a homebrew uh, perspective because I know a lot of pro brewers that do homebrew con seminars. They're doing the seminars, but they're not actually homebrewers anymore. And I, I still was brewing, so or at least I was still okay. fermenting at home. Yeah. See, that's uh, that's something we never really got too deep into. That we did yeah. some some kind of mixed beers. We did the um, uh, what was it? Was it the White Labs or the Y E uh, Farmhouse American Farmhouse Blend? Oh, that's a great blend. Okay. Yeah. We did yeah. our Saison and then we pitched that in it and, uh, delicious. I mean, came out really, really good. And, you know, uh, funny you mentioned that, that, uh, we had a beer called Table Bretta that we used that blend in and we, we poured it at, uh, Pro Night for that Homebrew Con. And there was actually a lot of questions specifically about that beer. And I shared the recipe for that beer in that lecture. So if you, cool. if you go into the Homebrew Association and, uh, dig out that, dig out the video of that lecture. You'll find a recipe in there for that. Well, good stuff, Shilpi. Well, I got another question, another little technical question for you that uh, we saw some work you did there at, at OSU, a semi-automated one chamber malting system. And that sounds pretty darn fancy. What's that all about? Oh, okay. So I have, uh, my background is in mechanical engineering and in food science. And so I grew up in New Jersey and I went to school in Philadelphia for engineering. And then I caught the beer bug in Philadelphia because it's a, it's a great beer town. And when I graduated, I left Philly. I didn't have as much good beer, started homebrewing. And that turned into an obsession that led me to Oregon State and pursuing this career. So while I was at Oregon State, they have a solid engineering program there as well. And there was a senior design team that got funded via the engineering department and the food science department via this guy, Dr. Patrick Hayes. Patrick Hayes heads up the barley project at OSU. And he is growing a lot of experimental varieties of barley and marketing them towards all sorts of food uses. But because Oregon State has a fermentation program, they also market them towards the malt world. And a way of malting things quickly in-house was the goal of this project because he was paying a significant amount of money to take an experimental barley variety and send it out to get malted and then he would get this back. But the timeline was a little bit delayed and the data wasn't real time and he wanted better data. So he pulled some funding together and he got this engineering team to make a malter. It's called the mini malter. But the malter was made by engineering students to specifications that they understood to be not as precise as a maltster would actually want them. Okay. And, uh, oh. yeah. 
so it never really made great mall. And so I, a few different students had worked on this project at the time in the food science department, just trying to operate it, but none of them really could get good results out of it because they didn't understand the software that was controlling the thing, which was LabVIEW. And when I got there, I let the food science pilot plant uh, manager, Jeff Clausen, I let him know that I was interested in, in a, a plant job or like a job at the, in the brewing science department of some sort. And they had this thing that was kind of collecting dust for a term. No one had gotten any good results from it. And they were like, what do you know about LabVIEW? And I was like, oh, I know how to use LabVIEW because I went to engineering school. So I was put in charge of it in order to try to make good malt, but also to write up a list of things they could modify or change that would help it make better malt. I was given a lot of textbooks about malting and sort of free reign to to have at the project, uh, have at the problem. And I had to do it in my free time. So, and malting takes forever. It's really hard. I have so much respect for maltsters as a result of this project. <laughs> it's really difficult. And I made some okay malt, but at the end of the end of the end of the thing, when I left school, I, I turned in a paper with a list of, you know, suggested modifications they can make that would help them make better malt. But it was, it's an all-in-one chamber. So you could do the couching step, uh, it's called, which is just soaking in water. And you want to soak the barley kernels until they hit a, a certain moisture content, which is like 46%, if I recall. And then after that, you drain it and you want a certain amount of airflow to get germination going. And then after a few days of germination, you have the chit that comes out the bottom of the kernel. And then you have this thing called the acrospire that starts to grow up the kernel. And when the acrospire reaches 75% of the kernel length, it's ready to kiln. And so then you dry it out. Uh, and then when it hits a f- moisture content to 15%, you can turn on the heat and kiln it to a dryness level appropriate for Pilsner malt. Uh, we were just making base malt with this thing. It wasn't capable of hitting the temperatures required to make any type of crystal malt or dark malt. It had a lot of modifications that would need to be installed before it could hit those temperatures. But anyway, it was a fun project, and I have nothing but the most respect for for maltsters, especially the ones that figured this out hundreds of years ago before we had like, you know, real time temperature monitoring to see where the problems are and what changes need to be made and, and all that. It was a great project. The mini malter is, I don't even know where it is now. At For a little while, it was at Great Western Malting in Vancouver. And they, they had installed it there after sending it out, after Oregon State sent it out for some modifications, it went to Great Western and it became part of their pilot malting program. I don't think it's there anymore. But Great Western does have their own malt R&D facility, which has a mini malter and a mini little brew house and stuff. And uh, they do some fun projects up there. Well, it's been great. Good stuff. If people want to keep up with what's happening with Logs and Farmhouse Ales, where should they go? Thanks for asking. You can go to farmhousebeer.com or check us out on Instagram at Logs and Farmhouse Ales or on Facebook at Logs and Farmhouse Ales. Thanks, Tim, Brian, and Silent Nathan. We've uh, really appreciated <laughs> you it. guys having us on. <laughs> and uh, yeah, go on there, check out what's going on with the lager program. We have cans, we have home delivery in Washington and Oregon. We got plenty of Brett Saisons, fruit beers, sour beers, etc. You guys will love it. Awesome. Thanks, guys. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, that does about wrap it up for this episode of the Beer Guys Radio Show. Join us next week as Brian, we're getting crazy. Brian, uh oh. We're going to talk kombucha, what? Kefir fermented foods we're gonna have cultured south in the studio are those even real things they are real things and we are using the radio as a an outlet to talk about our pandemic hobbies so (laughs) other fermented things other than beer that we love as well we are beer guys radio on facebook twitter and instagram follow us along for more craft beer news thanks for tuning in have a great week and don't forget to drink local cheers cheers